Um, I don't know that there's a lot of background to this particular message today, but I do want to tell you this, that um, with the way my life has gone personally, there are some people in my life that could look at this message and scoff because I have not done personally, I have not done a very good job of overcoming myself and the world in the past. And people that know me and my history know that God has uh, done a tremendous work in my heart. I'm not the same person that I was 15 years ago, for sure. And so I wanted to say that first off, that um, the message that I'm giving is not so much about me, but how God can work in our lives. And I'm a witness to that. My personal witness is that I'm a changed person. And I would hope that placed in the same positions to make the same decisions in the future, that I would make different decisions based on what God's word says and how God has changed my heart. The title for today is Overcoming in a World of Compromise. And I don't want to spend too much time on the world of compromise. I think we all know and understand that um, that pretty much defines society today, compromise. Uh, think about it. In personal relationships, people compromise. Society encourages us to just do what our heart feels is right. And most of the time, that's wrong. In politics, this wealth of compromise. Compromise so that the governments of this world are not putting the people first. They're putting their own selfishness, their own interests in front of those of the peoples of the world and in front of God. Think about sexuality. There's tremendous compromise in the world of sexuality in, in our society today. Whatever feels good, do it. That's the theme. How about in the field of dress or entertainment or what we eat, our diet? All those things have just been opened up. We can do what we want. There's no accountability, and there's a world full of compromise. I don't want to dwell on those things today, but I want to dwell on what the Word of God says about we, how we can overcome those things in the world and how we can overcome ourselves. Maybe write in your notes if you have a pen today. Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7 is about <clears throat> Paul arguing inside of himself. The things that I really want to do, that I'm attracted to do, I find myself not doing. And the things that I don't want to do, those are the things I end up doing. It's a war within himself. And I think if you read Romans chapter 7, you get an idea you can identify with Paul. But remember, he gives us the answers in Romans chapter 8. And I just want to draw your attention, maybe jot this down in your notes. Matthew chapter 14 is the place where Peter and the disciples see Jesus walking on the water. And Peter asks, Lord, if that's you, invite me to walk out to you on the water. And if you look... Peter takes his eyes off Jesus and he sees the wind and the storm and that's when he starts to sink. Th those were just some extra things I had in my notes here. But what does the word of God say about overcoming in this world of compromise? In the compromise that gets into our hearts 
and our minds. Notice this text from Matthew chapter 24. These are Jesus' words. It says, Jesus tells us, <clears throat> but as in the days of Noah, as they were, so shall also the, son of, the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. And they knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the son of, coming of the Son of Man be. And here in Luke chapter 17, Luke says the same thing, but he adds this. Likewise also as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they builded. But in the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. What do these accounts have in common? People were just worried about the everyday things. They weren't focused on the judgment of God coming on them. They were focused on selfishness. Now, the things that they were doing recounted here, they, were, they bought and they sold, they ate and they drank, they planted and they built it. Those aren't bad things necessarily, but where is their focus? It's not on the judgment of God. It's not on overcoming the world and overcoming themselves. Look at what it actually says when the Bible records the flood. This is just before God said, sent the flood on the world. In Genesis chapter 6, 5 through 7, here's what it says. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. It seems to me like we are so close to that today. We are so close. And continuing in verse 6, And it repented the Lord Jehovah that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping things and the fowl of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. What a sad, sad account that is. It's going to come to that again. It's going to come to that again. As in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the day of the Son of Man. So what do we need to be focusing on? Building, planting, harvesting, marrying and giving in marriage. Those are all good things in themselves. But our focus needs to be higher than earthly things. <clears throat> I want to take just a moment here. What I'm going to say, come out of my mouth right now, is going to be shocking. Because here at Prophecies of Hope, we don't recommend any book but the Bible. But did you know that the Bible, the Bible recommends another book? The Bible recommends another book? We're going to read it right now. I'd like you to turn with me to Psalm chapter 19. Psalm 19, not chapter 19. Psalm doesn't have any chapters. I didn't realize that until a few years ago. It's Psalm number 19. And we're going to read about this book that the Bible recommends. So I think if the Bible recommends that book, then we can recommend that book. And here's what it says. It says, the heavens declare, declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. Now, I know it doesn't say the book here, but sometimes the nature that we live in, God's creation, is referred to as God's second book. We can look and see the things around us, 
And like Romans 1.20 says, Romans 1.20, I wrote it down here in my notes. The invisible things from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being un understood by those that are made. In other words, God's creation. Those things reveal his eternal power and Godhead or his divine nature. That means we're without excuse if we look around to God's second book, his creation. So back to Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Their line is gone out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoices as a strong man to run a race. His goings forth is from the end of heaven and his circuit into the ends of, the ends of it. And there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. I read this in a several different translations, and I put one on the PowerPoint for us this morning. This is from, it's not from the King James Version. I forgot to remove that. This is from the Bible in basic English. And here's what it says. The heavens are sounding the glory of God. The arch of the sky makes clear the work of his hand. Day after day, it sends out its word. In other words, it speaks to us. And night after night, it gives knowledge. There are no words or language. Their voice makes no sound. And it continues. Their line has gone out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. In them has he put a tent for the sun. Who is, like, who is like a newly married man coming from his bride tent and is glad like a strong runner starting on his way. Go, his going out is from the end of heaven and is circled to the ends of it. There is nothing which is not open to his heat. This is a revelation. When we look at nature, it's a revelation of God, who he is, how he has created us, and the beauty that he's given us, even in a 6,000-year-old sinful planet, we see those things today. So God's second book is how we can learn of God. God's second book is how we can take the focus off our everyday lives and put our focus on eternal things. But I don't want to stop here. I want to continue reading in Psalm 19 because David, the writer here, changes the focus from God's second book, the book of nature, to the first book. In verse 8, it says, The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, much, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned, and in keeping of them, there is great reward. Does that sound like overcoming to you? Who can understand his errors? Verse 12 says, cleanse me from my secret faults. Keep back thy sermon also from presumptuous sin. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. What's my point? That to overcome, we have to have a knowledge of right and wrong. That's a big part of the problem 
with the compromise of today. The people don't understand or don't have a sense of what's right and wrong. Where are they going to get that if it doesn't come from God's word and his second book? Here, David makes it clear. He wants to know what is right and what is wrong. He says in verse 12, Who can understand his errors? That's what Jeremiah chapter 17 says. Right? Here it is on the PowerPoint. It says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And verse 10 says, I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. So we've got a problem. Left to our own devices, we don't know what's right and what's wrong. I know the world teaches something different. The world teaches that that, that that good that's inside you, if that could just come out, everything would be fine. But that isn't what this text says. That isn't what the Bible teaches. It says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. How are we going to overcome if we don't know what we need to overcome? How are we going to overcome if we don't know what's right and what's wrong? But we have promises. We have promises that no matter what we encounter, God will make a way out. He's told us that he can give us the knowledge of what's right and wrong if we just search him out. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 12 through 13. Verses 12 and 13. Therefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. We've got to watch out for our own understanding, right? Verse 13. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will, with the temptation, also make a way of escape that ye may able, be able to bear it. <laughs> Isn't it wonderful that we have a heavenly Father who's thought all of these things through? He knows the way of salvation. That way is in His Son. His Son is the way. So, Let's see some examples from Scripture, good and bad, maybe bad about what not to do. And there's some examples of what to do so that we can overcome. I have here on the PowerPoint, Genesis chapter 3. We're just going to read just a few verses. And we've, we've all read this a lot of times. It should be very familiar to us. Genesis chapter 3, starting in verse 4, <clears throat> it reads, And the serpent said to the woman, You shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day that you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. So here's a temptation. And what is the temptation centered around? Selfishness, right? In other words, the devil is telling Eve, you're going to be like God. You're not going to die. She has a choice to make, doesn't she? She can believe God who has told Adam and Eve that when they eat the fruit, they will die. But the serpent is saying something different. It appears, it appeals to her selfishness. Here's the next verse. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired 
to make one wise. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. So who did she put her faith in? Who did she put her faith in? She relied on her own understanding because of her selfishness. So that's obviously not the example we need. But it shows us what not to do. And I'm sure if we look inside of ourselves, I know I can speak (laughs) as an example many times over that my selfishness has made me make choices in the past that go against the will of God in my life. My selfishness has denied what God has said. My selfishness has turned my faith away from God onto what I want so that I would compromise. Can you see that in your own life? But brothers and sisters, faith is a gift. It's a gift. It's the fruit of the Spirit given to us from God. And in Galatians 5, here's what it says. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. It's a gift from God. So how do we get that gift? Do we ask for it? Remember, we've seen that the example of the people in Noah's day and in Lot's day, their focus wasn't on faith. It wasn't on God. It wasn't on things that are above. Their focus was on the everyday life. Their focus was more on things that they could see and feel and touch. Those were important things. But faith, faith is something more than what we can see and feel and touch. Here's our text for today. 1 John 5, 4. For whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Think about faith for a minute. Think about the very nature of faith. Faith itself says that there's something outside of ourselves. Now, we can put faith in ourselves, that's for sure. But faith says we're putting our trust in a specific place, in something. It can be good, it can be bad. That's the nature of faith. I'd like for you to turn with me in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 39, and we're going to read this account of Joseph. And I thought when I read through this account that the words that I read in a specific place in this chapter just popped off the page in the context of faith and overcoming. We read about Eve and how she failed miserably. She was deceived. But Joseph in this account overcame. So in your Bibles, Genesis 39, I'm going to start in verse 1. And Joseph was brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him of the hands of the Ishmaelites, which had brought him down thither. And the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him. And that the Lord made all that he did prosper in his hand. And Joseph found grace in his sight, and he served him, and he made him overseer over his house. And all that he had, he put 
into his hand. That's Joseph's hand. And it came to pass from that time that he had made him overseer in his house and over all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was upon all that he had in the house and in the field. And he left all that he had in Joseph's hand, and he knew not aught he had save the bread which he did eat. And Joseph was a goodly person and well favored. This is tremendous witness for someone who's following God. Verse 7, And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph, and she said, Lie with me. But he refused, and said unto his master's wife, Behold, my master wotteth not what is with me in the house, and he hath committed all that he hath into my hand. There is none greater in this house than I, neither hath he kept back anything from me but you, because you are his wife. Now let me just stop right there. We can keep reading and we know the rest. We will in a minute. But look at what he did. He took the focus off of himself. He, took, he remembered someone else. The selfishness was not there. He put the focus, and in fact, he said to the man's, well, to Potiphar's wife, think about your husband. That's really interesting, isn't it? You know, Jesus summed up the whole law with Love to God and love to our fellow men. If we put them first, what will that do in overcoming? How do we learn to put them first? From Jesus Christ. Jesus put us first before himself. If Jesus can be in our hearts and teach us how to put others first, what difference is it going to make when things like this come up into our lives? Verse 8 again of Genesis chapter 39. But Joseph refused and said to his master's wife, Behold, my master wanteth not what is with me in the house. The focus went off of him and off of her onto someone else. Put someone else first and what they need. He hath committed all that he has into my hand. There is none greater in this house than I, neither has he kept back anything from me but thee, because you are his wife. Now then, how then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? The focus is on others and the focus is on God. That's how we get away and how we overcome. The only way that's in our hearts, a lack of selfishness is in our hearts, is because Christ teaches us that lack of selfishness. Look to others and what they need. Think about others and what they need. Think about God and what His will is. I don't have to go on here with Joseph. We get the idea. He remained faithful even though he was thrown in prison. I want you to turn with me to 2 Samuel chapter 11. Second Samuel chapter 11. <clears throat> I think we'll all recognize this when I start reading. Remember, what we saw in Joseph, he turned away from the selfishness he could have had in his heart, and he thought about others. 2 Samuel chapter 11. And it came to pass, after the year was expired, at the time when the kings go forth to battle, that 
David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. But David tarried still at Jerusalem. I think it speaks to David's selfishness at that particular point. And as we keep reading, maybe you'll get that same understanding. And it came to pass in an evening tide that David arose from his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman washing herself, and the woman was very beautiful to look upon. So let me ask you, if David had gone out to battle, like as was the custom, and not just sent his general Joab and all of Israel, he wouldn't have been in this position to see this woman bathing. Chapter 3, I mean verse 3 of 2 Samuel 11, And David sent and inquired after the woman, and one said, Is not this Bathsheba the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? And so, right there, we can stop. If David had thought about Uriah the Hittite instead of himself, this could have been very different. If he'd have said, wait a minute, at this point right here I have a decision to make. I can be selfish and compromise. Or I can think about someone else other than myself. Things could have been different. And it only comes through the teaching of Christ Jesus in our hearts. Verse 4, And David sent messengers and took her, and she came into him, and she lay with him. For she was purified from her uncleanness, and she returned to her house. And the woman conceived, and sent and told David, and said, I am with child. And David sent to Joab, saying, Send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. And when Uriah was come unto him, David demanded of him, how Joab did, and how the people did, and how the war prospered. And David said to Uriah, Go down to your house and wash your feet. And Uriah departed out of the king's house. And there followed him a mess of meat from the king. Wait a minute. You can see David's trying to cover his tracks. He knows he's been selfish. He knows he's done something wrong. Verse 9. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his lord and went not down to his house. And when they told, had told David, saying, Uriah went not down unto his house, David said unto Uriah, Come, Comest thou not from thy journey? When then didst thou not go down unto your house? And Uriah said to David, This is... Uh, earth-shattering in front of someone that's been so selfish. Uriah said to David, The ark and Israel and Judah, they abide in tents, and my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are encamped in the open fields. Shall I then go into my house to eat and drink and to lay with my wife? As you live and as your soul liveth, I will not do this thing. Oh. What is it like, have you had that experience when you made a wrong decision and somebody else that you know makes the right decision? It slaps you in the face pretty hard. Look at what Uriah did. He took the focus off his selfishness. He took the focus off his selfishness. He thought about God, the ark, and Israel, and Judah, and Joab. He thought about all those people, and he couldn't, with a good conscience, eat, drink, and be merry, for lack of a better term. The focus came off of himself when it was time to make a decision. And I don't think I need to go on with this account. We get the picture. How do we apply that to ourselves? 
How do we make it not about our selfishness, the decisions that we make for right or wrong? How do we do that? Christ teaches us that. He helps us to see with his eyes and not with our own eyes. Psalm 139, 23 and 24. This is David writing. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any wicked way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. This is asking God to discover what's in your heart. To teach you the things that need to be purged out of your heart. So that you can overcome the selfishness so that I can overcome my selfishness. It's by the instruction of Christ in my heart. I'd like you to turn with me to Jonah, and we're going to start at the end of chapter 1. The end of chapter 1. This is, we, we've read about uh, Joseph and how he made the right decision and he turned away from the selfishness that could have been in his heart. We've read about David and the selfishness that was in his heart and he acted on that selfishness. And Uriah the Hittite who didn't have any of that selfishness who thought about others. Jonah is interesting because at first he's selfish and he's thinking about himself. Of course, at the end of the story, he's kind of thinking about himself also. But he comes to the point. Things get so bad for him that he cries out to God. Chapter 1, verse 17 of Jonah. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. <laughs> he got tossed overboard by all the people on the ship because he told them, it's my fault. It's my fault we're in all this storm. Toss me overboard. But God wasn't done with him. Praise the Lord that he is patient with us. Chapter 2, Then Jodah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly. And said, I cried by reason of my affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me out of the belly of hell, I cry, cried I, and you heard my voice. For you had cast me into the deep, in the midst of the seas and the floods, compassed around me, all thy billows and thy waves passed over me. Then I said, I am cast out of thy sight, yet I will look again toward thy holy temple. What's happening? He's looking outside of himself. He recognizes that he's got no hope within himself. He's in this position because of the choices that he made. But God really wants to teach him. And he's trying him. Have you experienced that in your life? He says, yet I will look again towards thy holy temple. The waters compassed me about, even to the soul. The depth closed me around about. The weeds were wrapped around my head. I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. The earth with her bars was about me forever. Yet hast thou brought me up my life from corruption, O Lord my God. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came in unto thee, to thine holy temple. They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. That's an interesting text. That's an interesting text. I looked that up in, in, in several versions Here's what it says in God's Word translation. 
those who hold to worthless idols abandon their loyalty to you, meaning God. And the Bible in basic English, worshipers of false gods have given up their only hope. That's what that verse says in the Bible in basic English. So what about you and me? Do we have self as an idol? I'm going to compromise because I want that. I want to do that. I see things my own way. That's idolatry. It's not putting God first in our lives. Look at verse 7 again. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came in unto thee, unto thine holy temple. When we take the focus off of ourselves and our selfishness, that's the key to overcoming. And the only way we can take the focus off of ourselves is if we have a changed heart. A changed heart. Because our hearts are, they're despicable. They're selfish. What are the words of Jeremiah again? Our hearts are deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. So when Christ gives us a new heart, that heart is not focused on selfishness. That heart looks and sees others. That's how we overcome ourselves and, our, and, and the world. Our heart sees God's will in our lives and in others' lives. Taking the focus off of ourselves. Here are my last two texts for today. You can go ahead and put away your Bible because they're up on the PowerPoint. 1 John 2, 15 through 17. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passes away and lust thereof. But he that does the will of God abides forever. What's it saying? Take our focus off the world, off of our selfishness. Put it on God's will. And that is only accomplished by the changed heart that Christ gives us. And here's our text again for today. For whatsoever is born of God, born again, a new heart, overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. So friends, my prayer is, is first for you, that you can see that having that changed heart will change your focus from the selfishness that you have inside, from the worldliness that we can have. My second prayer is for me that I will see those things myself, and Christ will reign in our hearts. That's my prayer for all of us.